Welcome to the Arts and Oddities Podcast with A.M. Hall, starring A.M. Hall. Now, here is A.M. Hall. Welcome to Art and Oddities with A.M. Hall, where I talk about anything that strikes my fancy to include all kinds of creative works from children's cartoons to underground zines to identity politics and everything in between. My guests and I will discuss how art impacts and reflects culture and counterculture, enables individualism and conformity, and have loads of fun along the way. I am your host, A.M. Hall, a.k.a. Anthony Bonafini, a.k.a. Galena Storm, a.k.a. Aquaises Mancuso. In this episode, I talk about censorship and the necessity for free speech and how communication trumps any dirty word barrier. This idea leads directly into my discussion with Tim Batty, lead singer of punk band Dandelion Pipe Bomb. First of all, I would like to make an apology for the quality of the sound for today's podcast. Today's is the first guest I have who I did not have over personally to record with me, and so we had originally planned to record our conversation over Skype or some other type of medium, but unfortunately due to technical difficulties that didn't work out. So we ended up having to record our conversation over the phone, and the quality of the sound is pretty bad. It sounds like a recorded phone call. We cleaned it up a bit, but it is what it is. Fortunately, my guest is Tim Batty, a punk rock singer. So if the, you know, podcast today sounds a little rough around the edges, then it'll sound a little bit more punk rock. Yeah. Yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. There um, is a content warning for today's episode for coarse language. Speaking of which, I'd like to use my introduction to talk about censorship and how it relates to free speech. So far, I've managed to keep this podcast 100% safe for work. I've touched on a few sensitive themes, but for the most part, it's been a clean podcast. However, while I am trying to avoid dirty words... I am discussing adult subject matter, and if you can't use adult words when you discuss adult subject matter, then I don't know what to tell you. My guest today, Tim Batty, has a song with a pejorative title, and we have a discussion about it. In general, whenever someone says a swear word as an emphasis for something, it it gets bleeped out. This hasn't happened on the show yet, but it is my general plan. Not because I have a problem with such words, but because I know not everyone wants to hear them. And bleeping it out gives a level of plausible deniability. For transparency's sake, I should tell you that these podcasts do get edited, whether by myself or by Evie, for ease of listening. When people speak, there tend to be a lot of ums and ahs and stammers and stutters and, you know, all of those tend to get cut out because... It interrupts the flow of the show. At one point, Tim Batty just dropped an F-bomb, right in the middle of a string of ums, just when he was thinking of the next thing to say. That particular F-bomb just got edited out, not because it was a swear word, but because it was a filler word. It didn't add anything at all to the discussion. But the song I mentioned before, with the dirty word in the title, it had to be left in, because bleeping it out would have left it so it didn't make any sense. In spite of his coarse language, Tim Batty is an intellectual. The discussion is worth listening to, especially if you're a fan of history. When you say that certain things are just bad, bad ideas, bad words, you're no longer making things just easier to listen to. You're censoring, and that creates an environment to just censor things that you don't like. And that's not the environment that I am trying to create. At the end of the day, I I really don't care if you use bad words. I'm far more concerned with providing intelligent discourse. 
if you have to use swear words to do it, I'm fine with that too. I'd rather be honest and bring true perspective from thoughtful artists. And so the point I'm trying to make here is say what you mean and mean what you say. Remember that communication is art too, and if harsh language is required to make yourself heard, who am I to stop you? And since we're already behind the language warning, if you want to be a bullshit artist, then be a bullshit artist. As Jen Donahue said on a previous episode, I'm not the thought police. I only make the words. And so, from this point on, this episode does have a content warning for strong language. That being said, I hope you continue to listen. All right, I am on the phone here with Mr. Tim Batty. How are you today? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm doing great. And you, sir, are the lead singer of Dandelion Pipe Ball. Yes, I am. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the band? Well, it was founded by me and a couple of friends uh, about two and a half years ago at an open mic. They uh, approached me about taking something with my spoken word and maybe doing something more with it, you know, adding instruments kind of stuff. Okay. I, I do want to make a confession here. I probably would not have known about your music if I wasn't housemates with Evie. I, I don't really... I like punk fashion. I like the punk mindset, but I've never really been into punk music. But because Evie's been playing the music throughout, you know, the house, I've come to develop an appreciation for it that I would not have otherwise had. And there seems to be a lot of really deep stuff in there. It sounds very stream of consciousness, but the deeper meaning is there, so it's very clearly well thought out. Can you tell me where the inspiration comes from? A great deal of it is my own personal survivalism and, you know, encounters in my life. I'm not really great at uh, communicating just, like, vis-a-vis with other people about, oh, this is what I experienced, this is what I lived through, this is what I had happened to me. It's a lot easier just to kind of, like, put it in a poem or uh, add it to a canvas and just, you know, give it to the world and be like, okay, here you go. And for me, I've expressed it it's off my chest. And then I don't have to have like people looking at me like, oh, you poor thing. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I'm like, no, it's just for me, it's background noise. It's details that got me to this point. Mm-hmm. I did make a note that it sounds like spoken word poetry that's set to music. Is that mostly what it is? Pretty much. Um, okay. I have this general philosophy on uh, music is learning how to perform and like do music is a newer aspect in my life. Mostly, like, playing well with others. It's a newer aspect of my life now. All right. It's easier to just do a painting or read a poem at an open mic, and then, boom, I'm off the stage after, like, ten minutes. I don't have to worry about practices. And... Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any influences? Um, Electric Six, Captain Beefheart, and his magic band, Frank Zappa, even Lords of Acid. Um, one of my personal favorite uh, influences, performance-wise, would be, say, like the Tiger Lilies, okay. um, where they both mix dark and deep humors with, like, serious context. <laughs> you do have a lot of uh, themes with awkward longing and open inadequacy, so stuff that's really personal. Where does that come from? Does it just come from seeing other people, or does it come from your life, or is it... I'd say it's mostly my life. I didn't have much of a family dynamic growing up, mainly because I spent eight years in state custody and group homes didn't exactly kind of teach you to be a um, well-accepted or well-adjusted human being in society. And being a fat, gothic, transvestite, queer kid in the group homes, yeah, just a huge target on the back kind of stuff. Yeah. I, you know, I was going to mention that. You do have a bit of a transformation sequence uh, when you're on stage. I've seen in a few of your videos where you just take off a suit and underneath you're wearing a dress. Can you tell me about where that came from? Well, it was something that like I was inspired to do. Um, well, mostly out of convenience during uh, the cold, colder months that I like to perform in a dress because, well, I like to wear dresses. And at times I like to wear suits, but I don't always like to wear my suit when I'm performing. Okay. Uh, it was kind of like an idea to like, you know, shock my friends a little bit because they've seen me performing in a dress. They've seen me perform in a suit. 
but they've never seen this. And then we're like doing this brand new song of just highly offensive, terrible like things, you know, yeah. where I'm, I'm pretty much even decimating my own childhood, you know, icons. There's a precedent in music to cross-dress on stage. You know, there's Alice Cooper, there's Dee Snyder. Dee Proud, and a lot of people, you know. I think it's this acidity of, like, that sense of freedom of, like, you know, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to do. You know, not just punk, but, like, most of all of rock and roll mm -hmm. or performance art in itself, you know. For me, when I get on that stage, it doesn't matter if I'm the one opening up the night or if I'm closing up the night or there's five people there or 200 people there. It's my stage. That, that sense of freedom, even if it's just for 20 or 40 minutes, nobody can tell me this ain't who I am. Mm -hmm. What does your outfit have to say about your identity? Or if not your identity, what are you trying to say with it? You know, I don't really think about it. Like I'm trying to make a statement with my outfit. I wear what I wear because it's mine and I want to wear it. The dresses I buy, I, I'm not doing it to shock or offend anybody, not in this day and age. I do it because it's my dress. It's something, you know, the patterns, the cloth, um, the cut of the you know, fabric, how it looks on it. Okay, because I know Evie did give me permission to make this comparison. Evie's more like Alice Cooper than RuPaul, but ultimately has more in common with Eddie Izzard in that, you know, they identify as a transvestite. Yeah. So, and you do as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. To quote Eddie Izzard, like, he actually corrected somebody in an interview once. They asked him, well, why do you wear women's clothes and clothing? And he just kind of snapped and he goes, no, I'm not wearing women's clothing. I'm wearing my clothing. When yeah. a woman buys a pair of pants, you don't say they're wearing men's pants. You say they're wearing their pants. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, for someone like me, I'm a genderqueer person. I feel like... I'm given less permission to wear the things that I'd like because if I go out in a skirt or a dress, people are going to read me as female and they're not going to question anything any further. But if I wear pants, they're still going to read me as female and they're not going to question me any further. It's perfectly okay for someone who is assigned female at birth to wear whatever and still get read as female. It's a little bit hard to say, hey, no, I'm not that thing. On the other hand, you know, I, I don't get called out at all, ever. So it's a little safer, I think. Yeah, pros and cons of anything in this world. There's, as far as progress goes, is the emotion of society. Yeah, there's a lot of awful, terrible things that still happen in this day and age. But, I mean, it, it gets a little bit better. It gets a little bit better, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, especially seeing the stuff that people before my generation had to deal with how they had to suffer. I had a fairy drag mother who kind of taught me when I was 15 that it was okay to be who I am. And, you know, it was because they had to live through the 70s and the 80s where they were ostracized. And when the 90s came around and they were still, they still, they still had that paranoia and that fear of getting dressed up, going to a club and walking down the street where at worst, the worst that's ever happened to me is I've gotten spat on and called a faggot. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a certain nostalgia for the old days, but the old days were only good for the greater majority. There was a, there was a strong conformity to the previous decades, I think. Yeah, somebody like me would have probably been stuck in a mental ward. And you and me like, both lobotomized. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's pass on the good old days. <laughs> yep, good old days. Tell me a little bit about your band members. I know you have, you know, the traditional drummer and guitar. You also have a guy who runs around on stage with a cowbell. Tell me about these people. <laughs> Uh, that would be my uh, drummer. His name is Matt Brown, also known as the Purple Monkey. Okay. Because one of the analogs to the band is we like to call ourselves the Anarchist Circus. Mm -hmm. And so when people join the band, I give them their circus name. So my drummer is Matt Brown, also known as the Purple Monkey. He's the one with the cowbell that just goes to town. The one where you saw him, like that, like one of the very first videos, that was before he was my proper drummer. Okay. And uh, yeah, I, I wrote, I've, I've lost a few members and gained some throughout the last two and a half years. My bassist, which has been basically my rock, is named Jamie Roy Traveris. Big old bushy beard. Plays bass, kind of does, so it's like a light up poi at the end of his uh, um, bass head and uh, just let that thing swing. I like to call him the Lion Tamer. I recently had a, I had a loss of a couple of guitarists, and uh, conveniently enough, like one of my oldest friends actually just like said, "Hey man, I kind of heard through the grapevine that you need a guitarist." And I'm like, "Well, how do you know?" And I'm like, "Well, I know how, how you know." The monkey told you. Um, and <laughs> the monkey told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, he's known as Mother Superior, um, Nick Hallenbeck. But okay. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really good friends. They've, they've been very supportive to me. Um, Nick, um, the mother and the monkey both play in another band called Nobody's Boy Scouts. Okay. And I think more um, bluegrassy, kind of um, alt rock, a little bit slower, but still really solid. And, uh, but I go out to an open mic every week and I hang out with these people and... It's important to be friends with your bandmates, especially yeah. if, you know, you're you're working hard on something creative together. It's important that you get along. Yeah, because everybody has their own personal influences and reasons for being in the band. And I encourage us all to have fun. I encourage as much as I, I because it's my band and I found it as much as I play the whole dictator card. Um, <laughs> I still want everybody to have a voice. I still want everybody to participate and have moments and go, maybe we should have a um, instrumental here, or maybe we should speed up this song and such. Um, when I say I'm a dictator, it's literally you can't. I, I go, you can't tell me not to do something. Okay. I we lost one of my first guitarists because of that, and. It was their own fault because a lot of our songs, there's almost a sense of parody. There's a sense of satire into it. There's humorism, like consistently disappointing, where I'm like, Yogi and Boo Boo's in a gay relationship and Boo Boo's on top. While the ranger watches, and I think he likes it. Okay. You know, stuff like that. That that sense of parody and awfulness and weirdness and stuff. And um, I, I was writing a song called Helena Troy Has a Golden Pussy. Has a golden what? Pussy. Oh, okay. And when I was writing the song, like, everybody in the band, like, Jamie and Matt loved the idea because they kind of got behind it. It makes a lot of sense why someone would get kidnapped and be held captive for 10 years. They start the first written war of man. Yeah. And, but my, my then guitarist thought I was being, like, kind of came across thinking that this was, like, misogynistic. And I'm like, you know, no, dude, because listen to the other words in the song. Helena Troy has a golden pussy just like Mother Tara intended. Well, Paris has a two-inch diamond dick, and he doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm not mocking um, Helena. I'm mocking all these, like, male figures throughout history and their own inherent sense of inadequacy. Mm-hmm. That's really deep. Of course, he ended up, you know, kidnapping Helen, but she was already married to someone else at the time, so... <laughs> Yeah, the king of Sparta. I think mean, that's like the last person who wanted to kidnap his wife. There's an entire culture of people whose entire existence is war. I'm gonna, I want that guy's wife. <laughs> Sounds perfectly reasonable to me. <laughs> now, Evie and I are making this film together, The Trial of Hephaestus, and we are featuring one of Dandelion Pipe Bomb's songs right in the middle. We are featuring Love Letter from the Devil. Can you tell us a little bit about that song? It's one of my uh, more, most intimate and uh, favorite songs. Uh, we usually close out with that one. I, I wrote it when I was in a very kind of hard place, mentally and emotionally. And um, when I first approached my uh, bandmates with it, they were like, kind of, this is not exactly our usual forte of you know, kind of fun and tongue-in-cheek stuff. We, we do have a fair share of like seriousness. But, yeah, this one, like, kind of got me through as a bit of a, you know, philosophical Satanist, subgenius, discordian, mm-hmm. make your pick. I, I kind of feel like, in a universal sense, that Lucifer, the Morning Star, however, whatever name you want to buy them by, mostly just got, like, shafted the story of creation, beauty, seeking love, punished for doing et etc. Et and... My own personal life and history, I don't feel any fear of having to go to hell. I don't feel now there's any sense of if I go to that place because I don't like to seek forgiveness. I'm not inherently a bad person. If hell does exist, it's where the bad people go, and then somebody has to have to fucking take care of those bad people. Is it a shitty job? Yeah, but somebody has to do it. Now, that's an interesting take on the devil. And you know what? Um, I see it as this ideal of, you know, hell might be just a place where all of God's children that doesn't get love, at, doesn't find the love in this world, actually do find it. Because if people want to actually be more, like, analytical on the actual story of the fall of the Morning Star, it's because they sought their creator's love. Okay. No one's going to say your work isn't deep. I will say that. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, there's one song where, at first glance, I had 
I didn't think much of it. There was cheese and pickles. The lyrics being cheese and pickles, cheese and pickles all day long. This isn't what I, I expected. Just cheese and pickles. And it's, maybe it's because I've never worked in food service. I've only ever worked in retail. But it definitely, for someone who, you know, would assemble burgers all day long, that's certainly what what their day would be like. She just, boom, cheese and pickles cheese all day pickles, long. Cheese and pickles. I want no crackers. Yeah. Uh, a lot of my stuff has, you know, you don't come across like, you know, very like tongue in cheek and, you know, oh, wow, this is, this is just your archetypical like garage punk band just kind of like bullshitting around and I'm like not really <laughs> we, we got a couple of our songs where we are being very facetious mm-hmm. um, when I'm demented is one of them but even even in the facetiousness it was reminiscent of my time in a mental ward where people were literally losing their minds and had no idea where they were or who they were and I find that, that that was very terrifying mm. to me. I mean, and I was in the middle of my own reasons, let alone what they were in there for. And like, I always felt bad for that. And I always like, you know, tried to be the sympathetic soul and be like, no, nah, man, you're cool. You're fine. Yeah. Here's your, here's your Nancy Drew book, which you've probably read a thousand times, but it's brand new to you. Yeah. I have also spent some time in a mental ward. I think my experience was completely different from yours. I was mostly in with people who were in their detoxing, like either being depressed, saying maybe they were going to be moved to a different place later, but I got out after that. There was one guy who tried to electrocute himself with a light bulb while I was in, but they were mostly together. Like, they knew who they were and where they were and what they were doing there, but they it was obviously they were still mentally ill, even for being present. There's an old saying, if God loves the uh, man and the little children, what does that say about the mad little children? Just a thought I have. I would like to take a moment to ask you to uh, plug yourself. Are there any projects that you're currently working on that you're excited about? I got Dandelion Pipe Bomb. Um, we're working on um, our first EP. Hasn't been made yet. Uh, it's going to probably be a couple of months out. Gathering punks in all in one place is like hurting kittens. I'm always painting. Always just getting myself out there. Just making artwork. Putting it out in the world. Whoever the hell wants it. Um, I'm working with um, a club owner, um, Davey Moore, who also runs a record company, uh, Midday, the Midday Records. Uh, the club's called uh, Alchemy in Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. About twice a year, he uh, hosts this um, gathering uh, called the Midday Social, and it's pretty much just like people who do radio, recording artists, musicians, visual artists like any bands as well, and that's actually happening tomorrow. Yeah, I'm just promoting me and myself, and I have nothing really major in the woodworks at the moment, just going on one week at a time. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I cannot fault anyone for doing that. Now, I'd like to play a song of Dandelion Pipe Bombs for the audience. Do you have a favorite you'd like me to send them out with? They're all my favorite. I, I wrote them all, so. <laughs> this will be Consistently Disappointing by Dandelion Pipe Bomb. I'm not sorry. <laughs> all right. Please stay tuned after the song for the show credits. Once again, this is Dandelion Pipe Bomb with Consistently Disappointing. The things I say, oh, they might have been you. The things I do might be a bitter pill on your mind. But that's all. The world's gonna keep on spinning.
threshold of a dream. You're on the threshold of a dream. Thanks for listening to the Art and Oddities podcast with A.M. Hall. That's our show for today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go through the grueling task of leaving us a review on whatever platform you're using to listen. I have a new and improved URL to the iTunes page. It's tiny.cc slash amhall, or just Google Art and Oddities podcast for the player of your choice. 
The production and editing of this podcast has been provided by Reverend Panic Evland Bedlam, and without her, it would not exist. If you'd like to support this podcast, why not put a virtual tip in our jar at patreon.com slash panicbedlam. That's P-A-N-I-K-B-E-D-L-A-M. As we produce more shows, we will be putting more content on Patreon exclusively for patrons. You can also help Panic by buying her books to include a physical copy of The Trial of Hephaestus on lulu.com, or one of her two tarot decks available at thegamecrafter.com. You can find them by searching Panic Bedlam on either site. Links will be available in the show notes. Our theme music, Doxel Dance in Spacetime, or Belial and His Seven Wives, was composed and performed by Kion Huru Orion, or as I know him, Michael. Thanks, Michael! If you would like to contact the show with comments or suggestions, you can email us at artoddiespodcast at gmail.com. Next week, I welcome back local writer Jen Donahue. This time, we'll talk about her writing group and the idea of sharing your art with others and how scary that can be. That about wraps it up. Remember, the highest form of magic is doing, and expressing yourself is art. This is A.M. Hall, signing off.